All right, do you know that movie? Yeah. What, what movie is that? Great movie for a day with a 100 degree temperature outside, right? <laughs> well, that movie is very interesting. That's the intro to that movie. There's a man, George Bailey, who's getting prayed for. And there's these angels talking in heaven. And, and one says, there's a man down there who needs our help. The other one says, oh, no, is he sick? The other one says, no, it's worse. He's discouraged. Now, that movie has terrible theology. I mean, angels getting their wings when bells ring. But it does make a great point that discouragement can be worse than being sick. Today, we're going to talk about discouragement. We're going to talk about trials in a message called On Trial out of Genesis 26. So I invite you to open up your scriptures to Genesis 26. Now, we all walk through valleys. And maybe some of you have even gotten to the point that George Bailey has in that movie of questioning, is it really worth continuing to live? Is it worth to continue this? Is life really worth living anymore? And if we're honest, there's a lot that can discourage you in life. There's no such thing as a trial-free life without suffering. Charles Spurgeon said this, God had one son without sin, but he never had a son without trial. And so in today's text, Genesis 26, We're going to learn about trials and hard times in a variety of different forms. We've zoomed in now on Isaac. He was the promised son of Abraham and Sarah. Isaac is going to now be the one who receives the promises. They continue down to bless the world. The Messiah is going to come through his line. This is the nation Israel that's going to produce the Savior Jesus who came on a rescue mission from heaven to rescue us from hell. And so we're very interested in Isaac. So far, we've seen him as a complex man. On one hand, he he loves God. He's a very spiritual man. We see him meditating and praying, persistently praying. Remember, 20 years he prayed for his wife, Rebecca, to have a child, and, and God answers that prayer. So he's a godly man, but on the other hand, this morning we're going to see that he's a sinner, too, who does some really foolish things on occasion. So godly and yet sinful, uh, not unlike many of us, we struggle with that, warring the flesh, the spirit, that, that tug of war that always goes on. So anyways, let's get into the chapter this morning. Let me pray and invite the Holy Spirit to teach us through the word. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather this morning, open up your scriptures, Lord, and hear a message from you. Father, we pray that you would open up our hearts to hear your words this morning. Would you comfort us? Would you encourage us? Would you challenge us? Father, would you be glorified in what we do this morning? We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's get into the text, starting in verse 1. This might sound familiar. It says this, There was a famine in the land, besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. And so here we are. We have a total bummer out the gate of the chapter, a famine, which means no food. This is immediate bad news, and we've seen this before. It actually talks about that in the text, the days of Abraham. Abraham went through a famine. Do you remember what he did? He went down to where? Egypt. He went down to Egypt, and here we see Isaac. He's going to go down to Gerar, which is in the Gaza Strip, so still in the promised land, but, but further south. So let's talk about trials. Sometimes trials just happen to us, right? This famine, it just kind of happened to Isaac. It's outside of his control. It's thrust upon him. Why is that? Why do we encounter trials? Why are they thrust upon us? Well, we are in a fallen world that's been broken by sin. Human nature causes us to get upset at trials. We say, that's wrong. Why do bad things happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? Have you heard that question before? That's actually the wrong question. The right question is, why do good things happen in this world at all? Because Romans 8.22 says, We know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And that's as a result of sin. The whole creation has been fractured by sin. Of course there's suffering. Of course there's injustice. Of course there's disease. That's what happens when the entire creation is corrupted because of sin. The miracle is that anything goes well at all in this world. 
And so trials, we know, will happen. Oftentimes, are out of our control. And we have two choices to make when we do encounter trials. The first choice is this, to blame God for the trial. The second choice is to trust God in the trial. Look at this verse from James chapter 1. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Notice it says when, not if. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. At the end of the day, my friends, that's either true or it's not. Is that true? Yes, it is true. So why does God allow testing? Why does he allow trials? This is our first point this morning. God allows trials not for our destruction, but for our instruction. Not for our destruction, but for our instruction. So here we begin the chapter with a famine that a sovereign God allowed to happen. This is presumably the first famine in over a hundred years since Abraham's early sojourn in Canaan, the one that caused him to go to Egypt. So let's continue the text. Verse 2, Then the Lord appeared to him, to Isaac, and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws." So this is actually the Lord's first recorded time talking with Isaac. He's speaking to Isaac, which is encouraging because notice God's relational heart here. God is speaking to Isaac in the middle of the famine. He's saying, don't freak out. Trust me. Don't do what your dad did and go down to Egypt and disobey me. He said, stay here. I'm going to get you through this trial. It's going to be okay. And so God intentionally draws near to his son Isaac in the midst of the tribulation. And he repeats the covenant that he made to Isaac's father, Abraham. Notice the the bit about the land, the bit about the descendants, and the bit about the blessing. So it's all there. Now, Isaac went down, what did it say in verse 1? He went down to where? Gerar. And who did he meet there? Abimelech. Now, that's a name we've seen before, and you might be thinking, wait a second. This sounds awfully familiar. Abraham went, and he met an Abimelech as well. Well, this is most likely not the same person. Abimelech is kind of like Pharaoh, where many people could be called Pharaoh. Abimelech just means royal father. And so this is most likely a title, not a proper name. So this is a leader, a Philistine leader, but it's a different person, most likely. And then let's get to verse 6 here. The story will sound familiar, though. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar. And the men of the place asked about his wife. And he said, she is my sister. For he was afraid to say, she is my wife, because he thought, lest the men of the place kill me for Rebecca, because she is beautiful to behold. Does this sound familiar to anybody? There's another Abimelech, another wife, the same lie, right? She's, she's my sister, not my wife. And he's scared because Rebecca's beautiful. He thinks that they're going to kill him so that somebody can take his wife. Right? He has something to gain if he's the brother. He's got everything to lose if he's a husband, according to the way that he's thinking. But it's like father, like son. Some commentators think that this was only one story and, and somehow it got corrupted over time. And we hear it a couple different times in the text. That's baloney, okay? God intentionally puts this story in here to teach us about generational sin. And it's a warning, like father, like son. He's committing the same sins of his father, Abraham, in this regard. He's walking in his father's footsteps. And we'll notice that their stories have remarkably similar promises, similar tests, similar failures, and also similar triumphs. So the story doesn't end right here. Let's continue. Verse 8. Now it came to pass, when he had been there a long time, so you can only imagine what that's like, you know, his wife separated from him maybe everybody thinks that his sister maybe some guys are coming to suit her and then it says this Abimelech king of the Philistines looked through a window and what did he see he saw that there was Isaac showing endearment to Rebekah his wife 
Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, Quite obviously, she is your wife. So how could you say, she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I said, lest I die on account of her. And Abimelech said, What is this thing you have done to us? One of the people might soon have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt on us. So Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So Isaac gets himself in a pickle here. And this is the next point today. Sometimes we bring trials upon ourselves. So sometimes trials just happen. They're thrust upon us because we live in a fallen world. Sometimes, in the words of Jimmy Buffett, it's our own dang fault. You know that little song, (laughs) right? It's our own fault. Sometimes we have no one to blame but ourselves. Isaac took a play out of his dad's playbook, this lie which his father Abraham actually told twice back in the day, and it gets him in trouble. He puts his wife, Rebecca, in danger, and the promised line of the Messiah, no less, right? God promised through him he would bless the world. If his wife gets taken away with some other man, how is that going to happen? So he's putting a lot at risk here, all to protect his own self. But his sin gets exposed. Abimelech, the king, just happens to look over and he sees him, the Hebrew actually says, laughing with his wife, Rebecca. And it's an intensive form of the verb in Hebrew, laugh. So maybe meaning something like flirt, caressing, making love. I don't know, but it's something you wouldn't do with your sister. He sees them and he says, wait a second, you're busted, man. Come over here. That's your wife, isn't it? And this is actually, this whole thing is a wordplay on Isaac's name. Remember, Isaac's name means laughter. And so he's caught laughing with his wife, really making a mockery of the promise, mockery of the covenant, because he's going to lose his wife by lying about her. So Isaac is in trouble pretty much because he decided to be an idiot. And everyone wants to be a victim these days, right? But sometimes we suffer due to our own foolishness. Now, I collected a few stories I love these, these uh, dumb criminal stories. You guys know about dumb criminal stories? You look up the Darwin Awards, and you'll see these stories of dumb criminals. Here's a couple examples. Two Welsh tourists landed themselves in court in 2012 after they got drunk and stole a penguin from SeaWorld in Australia. The penguin's name was Dirk. Reese Jones, 21, and Carrie Mules, 20, from South Wales, broke into the park on Queensland's Gold Coast, swam with the dolphins, and let out a fire extinguisher in the shark enclosure before making off with poor Dirk the penguin. When they woke up, hung over and with the flightless bird in their apartment, they tried their incompetent best to care for him by feeding him and putting him in the shower, the court heard. They later released Dirk into a canal but were spotted by locals who called police. A magistrate fined them a thousand Australian dollars each and told them to drink a little less vodka. Dirk was rescued and returned to SeaWorld unharmed. (laughs) I thought that was a funny story. Now, this one, I think, even tops that. Officials were left baffled by an Afghan Taliban commander who gave himself up and then tried to claim the $100 reward for his own capture. (laughs) Mohammed Ashan, a mid- to low-level Taliban commander, was suspected of organizing attacks on U.S. and Afghan troops in the east of the country. According to reports, he walked up to a police checkpoint in 2012, pointed to a wanted poster featuring his face and asked for the $100 finder's fee. The authorities were at a loss to explain his actions, although one U.S. official reportedly told journalists, clearly this man is an imbecile. (laughs) There's a difference between being a victim and being a fool. You guys following me? Sometimes we bring trials upon ourselves. We bring pain upon ourselves. God didn't do it to us. We did it to us, and we need to own that. Listen to this interesting proverb. Proverbs 19.3. People ruin their lives by their own foolishness and then are angry at the Lord. Don't we see that played out? How crazy. We ignore God's warnings, and then we experience pain for the consequences of ignoring those warnings, and then we rage against God. How illogical of us. It's like, the kid blaming you for the burn that they got after you warned them not to touch the hot stove. The incredible thing about God, though, is that he's still a God of grace. We see grace, mercy, grace, mercy over and over and over again. We're about to see it one more time. 
The book of Genesis teaches us over and over again that everyone is corrupt, even the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're all corrupt. We keep looking at them as if they're going to be the hero, but actually God is the hero in the Bible. That old phrase, God helps those who help themselves, is not true. God helps fools. God helps idiots. God helps people who can't help themselves. He grants mercy to people like Isaac, who should have known better. And if I were God at this point in the story, I'd be like, you know what, I've been through this with your dad. I think I'm going to choose a different family to be the vehicle of blessing for the world. We're done. We're done. But no, I'm not God. And thank God, I'm not God. God is gracious. And let's just continue the story. Verse 12. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Are you catching how crazy that is after what we just read? (laughs) He's getting blessed. It's like, what? And then verse 13, the man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. For he had possessions of flocks, possessions of herds, and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. So the very first time Isaac decides to plant He's breaking records a hundredfold. Have you ever known somebody who had beginner's luck at something? No? no? I have, and it's infuriating, is it not? You're like, ah, you know? <laughs> so Isaac, he's prospering, and he's not prosper, prospering because he has some amazing natural talent or a green thumb or anything like that. We see behind the scenes that God is the one causing him to prosper, and he's blessing him, which reminds us that any talent that we have anything that we pride ourselves on, that thing that we do, that gift deposited in us by God, the successfulness we have isn't from us, but it comes from God. And now we see in verse 15, we saw that the Philistines were angry. Now continue. Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. They had filled them with earth. And Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us for you are much mightier than we. So Isaac is prospering. The Philistines get jealous. Abimelech feels threatened. They fill up all the old wells that Abraham had dug. They do this to sabotage him, to sabotage his crops. And eventually Abimelech says, get out of here. Get out of here. You're getting too wealthy. You're putting us in threat. You're greater than us. And we don't like that. Which leads us to the next point about trials. Sometimes trials happen to you because God's hand is upon you. Now this point might seem counterintuitive, but listen, sometimes trials happen to you specifically because God is with you. What do I mean by that? Well, you should expect some opposition as a Christian because it says this in 2 Timothy 3.12, yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So that's a guarantee. You're doing the right thing, you're blessed by God, you'll get persecuted. You will encounter trials at the hands of the ungodly. You'll be persecuted. But what does Jesus say? Matthew 5, 11, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. He said you're blessed. You should be happy about that. Not if, but when, right? When they revile you and persecute you. And it's just so ironic, right? Why would we think we would escape any element of hatred from the world when the one we worship, our Savior, got nailed to a cross? We worship a guy who was executed. Why do we think that we're going to somehow make it through life without experiencing a little hate for being his followers? 2 Corinthians 2.15 says this, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing which is an interesting verse because to some, your life as a Christ follower is a fragrant aroma. You smell nice. But to others, our life stinks. (laughs) We smell like death to them because we bring conviction to them. Our love, our generosity, our testimony, the truth that we declare, it's a bad aroma to them because they know that they're in the wrong deep down. And so they don't like it. And so they persecute. So here we see Isaac, he's enduring a trial 
specifically because God's hand is on his life. And I think that's very interesting. Now the story continues, verse 17. Then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. Also Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water there. Remember, wells are extremely important. If you've got large flocks, they're going to need to drink water. You're going to need the water also for crops. So this is extremely important. Verse 20, But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. So he called the name of the well Essek, because they quarreled with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that one also. So he called its name Sitna. The next point, sometimes trials happen to us, because people are people. <laughs> All right. Do you know what I mean by that? People are people. Isaac gets kicked out of the land, and now people keep showing up whenever he digs a well. The men of Gerar followed him to where he was and demanded his wells after he does all the work. Esek, the one well that they stole, was, it means quarrel in Hebrew, and sitna means hatred. So that's what he called those wells after they got stolen from him. This is actually the first mention in Scripture of Philistine hostility towards the people of God. But we see people being people. They're getting nasty with Isaac. They're being unfair. They're being fickle, selfish, touchy, insecure, territorial, imperfect, cray-cray. All right? People are people. And sometimes that can cause trials. And you know what? We're people too. (laughs) You and I are these imperfect people. We'll always let each other down. We're always going to stumble and mess up. That's just part of us being sinful humanity. And because of that, there's going to be tension. There's going to be friction. It's going to create trials in our lives. It's nothing new. And you know what? The church is not exempt from this. And Actually, the church is kind of a petri dish of this, okay? Because we're people that are trying to unite. We're united because of the Savior that we love and serve and believe in. We're trying to unite, but we're all sinful people, so we're fighting like this, you know, all the time. The New Testament epistles, you just look at Paul's advice to the churches. He's always saying, guys, you got to get your act together. Forgive each other. Be unified. Why would he say stuff like that if it weren't against our nature, right? We're always at odds with each other because we're people. We're sinful people. But when we encounter a trial like that, are we going to respond with bitterness or are we going to respond with grace? It's our choice. People are going to be people. We're people. But we need to overcome the natural, pursue the spiritual, and forgive each other and seek peace and reconciliation. And so in verse 22, Isaac, he moves from the two wells that were stolen from him. And it says this, verse 22, And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it, finally. So he called its name Rehoboth, because he said, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. Rehoboth means open spaces or room in Hebrew. And so after yet another trial, God provides, and Isaac is blessed again. Why? Because God's really good like that. He's really good like that. And then finishing off the chapter... Then he went up from there to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared to him that same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. And he pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with Ahuzath, one of his friends, and Phicol, the commander of his army. And Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me since you hate me and have sent me away from you? But they said, We have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. So we said, Let there now be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, since we have not touched you, and since we have done nothing to you but good, and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. Notice they kind of view the situation a little differently. Isaac is like, you guys kicked me out with hatred. And they said, no, we sent you away in peace. But these guys are coming back up. They've seen him prosper. 
And Abimelech comes up with some of his cronies. And they come up and say, all right, clearly God's hand is on your life. We want to make peace with you. We don't want to be an enemy of the one who, who has God's blessing. So Isaac, he felt the need to return to the place where he had been in closest fellowship to the Lord. He makes an altar, receives reassurance from God, and then after that brutal season of conflict over the two wells, God blesses Isaac with a well of peace, and then he makes peace with his enemies. Abimelech and the cronies come up and make a mutual non-aggression pact, also known as a parody covenant, with Isaac. And how do they seal it? Well, they're going to seal it by eating a feast together. Verse 30, so he made them a feast, and they ate and drank. Then they arose early in the morning and swore an oath with one another, and Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. It came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him about the well which they had dug and said to him, We have found water. So he called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. That sounds good, right? Food sounds good. Peace. That sounds amazing and refreshing as well. Picture someone in your life that you have conflict with right now. Just picture that person in your mind. Wouldn't it be awesome to have peace with that person again? Wouldn't it be a beautiful thing to have no drama, no issues, no conflict with that person? Ultimately, going from fussing and fighting to sharing a meal together and making promises. That would be a beautiful thing. As the Beatles sang, life is very short and there is no time for fussing and fighting, my friends. <laughs> life is short. Make peace. Who do you need to make peace with today? Who are you at odds with today? Give them a call right after church. Go out to coffee with them. Make things right. As much as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. And then we get to the last part of the chapter today. When Esau, who's Esau? Isaac's, not twin, Isaac's son, who had a twin brother named Jacob. It's been a little chapter since we've seen him. Well, we're going back to see Esau here for a second. When Esau was 40 years old, he took his wives, Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and Basimath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. So Esau takes these foreign wives, which leads us to the very last point about trials today. Sometimes trials happen to us because of family. Sometimes trials happen to us because of family. We see the grief here of the, the parents looking at who their son decided to marry. Family life can be difficult sometimes because Satan is real and because Satan viciously attacks the family. God instituted the family. Satan hates the family, so he targets the family. The very first recorded assault and murder in the Bible, remember? Cain killing Abel, that was between brothers. Then later on we saw Noah, who had a rebellious son who brought him dishonor. And then we saw that Abraham hasn't been the best husband, and so he created trials in his family. Sarah wasn't the godliest wife, so that created trials. Now here is Esau, the grandson of Abraham, the son of Isaac. He's making poor decisions that grieve his parents. He carnally decides to marry more than one woman. That's never okay, by the way. The Bible records the polygamy, but it never condones the polygamy, and it always leads to problems. <laughs> and so Esau carnally decides to marry more than one woman, and besides that, they're outside of the promised family. We don't know these guys, right? Biri the Hittite, Elon the Hittite, the people of the land. They're not God's chosen people. And so Esau is creating unions that he should not be creating. And eventually, the Edomites, a wicked enemy of Israel, is going to come from these relationships. So as we close today, thinking about family issues in particular, three quick bits of advice. If you're going through stuff in your family, number one, know that you're not alone, okay? It's common. It's common to have problems in your family. You're, you're not alone. Two, remember that God is bigger than those problems. So are you praying? Are you seeking godly counsel? Are you going to his word? Are you examining yourself and your own actions in light of God's word and what that would speak into the situation? And then three, forgive. Bitterness is always the wrong answer. Forgiveness is the right answer. 
So, in reflecting on this chapter, we've seen a lot of different things take place, but this pattern emerges in Genesis 26. Trial, blessing, trial, blessing, trial, blessing, trial, blessing, trial, blessing. And that's the story of the Christian life. Trial, blessing, trial, blessing. You will experience both trials and blessings in life. How will you respond to trials? How will you respond to blessings? Will you get mad at God in the trials? Will you forget God in the blessings? You can fall off the ditch on both sides of the road. Forgetting God when things are going well and blaming God when things aren't going well according to you. A major difference between believers and unbelievers is joy through the trials and gratefulness in the blessings. John 16, 33, I want to close with this. These things I have spoken to you, Jesus speaking to his disciples, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. The gospel is this, that Jesus endured trials and sufferings on our behalf to save us on the cross. Now, he didn't save us from all of our trials. No, our trials, remember, they're not for our destruction, but for our instruction. He came to save us from the death penalty for our sins. That's what he came to do. And he went to that cross and endured his own trial so that we could have the ultimate blessing of eternal life. If in here today, you've never taken care of your sin problem by acknowledging it, saying, you know what? I've offended a holy God because of my actions, because of my thoughts. I'm sinful. If you acknowledge that, trust in what Jesus did on your behalf by going to that cross, dying on that cross for your sins, getting buried, and then rising again to life the third day. If you trust him for forgiveness of sins and for eternal life, you can have it. It's a gift. But you have to repent and believe. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the scripture, Lord, these ancient words that we read about stories that happened so many millennia ago. Sometimes we wonder, what relevance could this have to my situation? But we see, Lord, this, this pattern of trials and the many different ways in which they come. Sometimes they happen to us. Sometimes they're our own fault. Sometimes they happen because people are sinful, and sometimes it's our own family as that's the cause of a trial. Father, give us patience through the trials to realize that they're for us to grow and to mature in our faith. Lord, you are testing us to see what kind of people we will be. Will we be faithful through trials? Lord, and when you bring blessings, as you so often do as a good God, will we be grateful to you? Lord, give us hearts of both patience and and gratefulness. And Father, we're so grateful this morning for our, having our sins forgiven through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I pray that if there's someone in here today who's never made a decision to follow him and trust him for salvation of sins, would they do so today? Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm-hmm.